Hello everyone and welcome to another webinar um, in partnership with Auto Rabbits and Salesforce Ben. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the three phases of Salesforce DevOps and um, I'm joined here today by Prashant um, who's going to be sharing his valuable insights after a long time working um, with DevOps. Um, so Prashant, why don't you give you a little bit of an introduction? Well, thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, well, I've been uh, in the Salesforce DevOps space for about a decade now. Uh, I head the products for AutoRabbit. Uh, we are a DevSecOps company uh, focused on Salesforce DevOps. Uh, we focus on the flow and feedback aspect uh, for the delivery of clean, safe code. And that's what I want to talk to uh, everyone here about is, uh, you know, we just want to uh, we've been involved uh, with Salesforce for quite some time, so uh, I thought it would be a, a good opportunity to talk about the the past, the present, and the future, uh, and how uh, we are seeing uh, in our day to day jobs of you know when when we work with these large banks and these large companies, uh, where are people headed at? So that's what this is about. Sure, great, thank you. And I'm Lucy Maslon. I'm the Operations Director at Salesforce Ben. And part of my role is really looking at what the ecosystem is talking about, what's the next big thing. And I think from my observations, DevOps, the conversation around it didn't really take off until 2020. That's when we really saw this appetite. Um, but of course, DevOps in one form or another has been around for, for decades. Um, so how about we uh, show them the agenda, Prashant? All right. Here's what we're going to cover. And as Prashant mentioned, understanding history is really important for us to go confidently into the future. Um, so understand how things were and why they've changed over time. Then you can take advantage of what the future could have in store. Um, so we'll show you the evolution of that. Then we'll head back to the 2000s with snowball development. And then the rise of DevOps during the 2010s. And then finally, DevSecOps, the current and evolving hot trend. So the evolution of DevOps and Salesforce. So back in 2001, even though Salesforce was two years old as a company at this point, um, the founders of Salesforce knew that by empowering their customers to configure Salesforce, um, they would secure um, their favor because as a configurable system, and you can tailor it to your business operations, it becomes sticky, um, find it so valuable that they don't wanna stop being a Salesforce customer. So this was almost like the first iteration of Salesforce setup. And then sandboxes. Like me, you may have thought sandboxes would have always just been a part of Salesforce. Um, sorry, do we mind if we go back to the timeline? Yeah. Um, so I thought sandboxes had been part of Salesforce forever, um, but, you know, pre-2006, admins and developers didn't have sandboxes. Go to 20, in 2010, um, love them or loathe them, change sets, really allow development teams to move metadata components between environments. Could you even imagine that sandboxes had existed without change sets for four years? Um, not only did change sets eliminate the need to duplicate configuration work in different environments, um, they reduced human error and were almost like a rudimentary way to automatically document your changes. Then we have the Salesforce developer experience, a set of tools designed to improve um, the traditional developer's experience building on platform, which included things like the Salesforce CLI, the IDE, Scratch orgs, et cetera. And now 2022, Salesforce DevOps Center arrived after a long anticipated wait. Um, so this is superseding change sets, um, and the DevOps Center offers version control and visibility over your release pipeline, which ultimately leads to better quality releases with fewer bugs and errors. And um, so we've come a long way from change sets to DevOps Center and now to DevSecOps. Um, these are what we can call the three phases of DevOps and Salesforce. So what can we expect to see next? But there are other DevOps challenges that aren't necessarily related to specific tools. Um, including the fact that new tools are released, introduced every year, making it so challenging to keep up with how these additional technologies are woven into your current DevOps processes. Increased data security threats, not news for everybody. Um, these require necessary and fast action whenever they arise. 
um, updated regulatory guidelines that must be addressed properly. And the demand for heightened productivity, security and quality never cease as the world continues to evolve. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Prashant, who's going to take us into more depth. Well, thank you very much, yeah, and uh, nicely done, Lucy. Because that's you know what you said there just for for, uh, for a second, right? It's been yeah. twenty years since Salesforce has come out, and it's only quite recently we have now started seeing Salesforce moving to more sort of a traditional development experience, if you will, uh, and they're doing a fantastic job with DX and DevOps Center. Uh, but so. Uh, the reason I say uh, but is because we need to understand a little bit about how uh, we got to the space and that's what uh, I'm gonna be talking about next so that we can talk a little bit about the future, right? So how was Salesforce development back in the, tw uh, in the early 2000s? In the early 2000s, you basically uh, are an early adopter of the Salesforce program. You only had probably one single production instance and all of the changes that any change that you would be doing would be directly in your production. So there is no change management. There is no version control or source control. So these were the good old days where, you know, Salesforce were, was a simple CRM and you can just quickly go in there and, you know, make, make any small changes um, uh, that, that you would want to see. Uh, and I bet, show of hands, if uh, you know how many of you here have seen the uh, the the oldest UI of Salesforce, which was basically built on simple HTML, right? Uh, so yeah, so our the resources were limited, things were uh, simple, and uh, we had uh, you know uh, uh, we had a journey starting from from uh, from where we are, uh, where we operated uh, around you know just having one production arc. So from there, things did take a very interesting turn. Um, you know, uh, obviously some of the disadvantages that you get um, propelled us to have a more sort of a change management practice uh, in place. So the lack of limited documentation, insufficient resource planning, you know, the fragmentation of releases, there was no automation in place. So it, it was basically Salesforce was built out as a CRM and not a development platform. So that itself, uh, sort of uh, had these uh, massive, massive uh, disadvantages when trying to move into a more uh, sort of organized development platform. So from there, Salesforce, uh, you know, started bringing out chain sets and, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you guys would be aware of ch how chain sets works and the problems that come with chain sets. Uh, so essentially what we've been seeing through chain sets is basically there's, again, you know, you have a good delivery of good system of code delivery, but you do not have sort of a control change management practice. So you still have to do that back in your Excel sheets or back in your Jira systems, uh, right? But you could not bring everything into one place. And this is where we saw that Salesforce was sort of moving through more uh, a DevOps approach where they were trying to, uh, you know, see if they can have a independent release management team take over the challenges, uh, you know, uh, that, that come with uh, movement of code from developer QA, you know, developer integration QA and production. So, uh, so this is where, you know, the advent of DevOps came in. Uh, and uh, this was around, I think, 2010s, where people started working uh, on uh, uh, the concepts of DevOps. I was one of the early adopters of uh, bringing Salesforce and, uh, you know, uh, source control close. Uh, before we went into source control, you know, I, I remember some of my colleagues uh, who basically uh, used to be working on, um, uh, Google drives and exporting code and storing them in their local file systems and so on and so forth. So uh, we tried to use the metadata API back then in order to see how we can uh, move the code uh, from, you know, start operating as a DevOps uh, on, on DevOps principles, making sure that uh, you have uh, sufficient uh, collaboration uh, going in between developers uh, so that you can you know, make sure that you're not stepping on each of the stores and so on and so forth. So from there, we basically started moving uh, into a more DevOps practices. And uh, uh, I think that's where Salesforce also started uh, this need where they need to uh, basically provide more and more tools uh, in order for uh, companies, uh, these massive companies that are adopting Salesforce to uh, start, uh, start using Salesforce as a development platform. Right. 
Uh, and one of the key requirements that come with Salesforce DevOps is, uh, you know, as we again go, went through this, the multiple tooling that Salesforce provided did leave out a couple of gaps. And this is where we saw uh, sort of this ecosystem booming where uh, people have started realizing uh, some of the challenges that come with uh, Salesforce DevOps. Like, you know, when you're doing uh, Delta only commits on how do you uh, eliminate accidental overrides? Uh, and I've seen teams do multi hour or multi day deployments. I've seen people uh, you know, struggle with the nested metadata uh, structures that Salesforce has in terms of their profiles and uh, triggers. Uh, and quite recently, we have seen with, with the advent of DX, you know, you're uh, basically moving to a package-based development where you can add incremental to your packages. Uh, we've seen issues where, you know, uh, rollbacks or the road to recovery when you had a bad release was a big challenge. And unit testing, again, was a key uh, challenge when, you know, when you wanted to adopt uh, into something uh, to do something around Salesforce DevOps. So... With that said, you know, we move forward. Uh, some of the essential tools that you needed during this phase is you needed to bring in automation. So this is where uh, people were starting to use tools like Jenkins and Circle CI, uh, starting to use GitHub, starting to see how you can do sandbox management, the data loader tool. So this was this was the era where uh, we basically started introducing a lot of tooling uh, to control Salesforce. So the metadata API was a gift from Salesforce uh, for uh, you know for the ISV company uh, uh, community to sort of uh, land and expand and you know build products that would make the life of everyday Salesforce developer easy. But there are some problems with this, and this is what uh, you know we started identifying, and this is where we started moving from DevOps to a more DevSecOps. And I'll tell you why. So the, there's a problem with this infinity loop that uh, that we often see. The problem with this infinity loop is it is very two-dimensional and it does not show the feedback loop of how, uh, where it exactly fits in your STLC process, where it does, uh, you know, where does the developer come in, where does the release manager come in, where does the QA come in. So this is, this is a very a generalistic approach of how uh, uh, DevOps should be. And it is oversimplified. In fact, uh, it does not present the day-to-day -day complexities of the day-to-day -day operations. I mean, when people see this and there are different, different versions that you'll see on the, on the internet, uh, and each one has their own sort of, uh, you know, uh, fine tuning to uh, to it, if you will. So it does not capture the day to day complexities, but it tries to represent in 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 a linear form. And I think it it actually is confusing and basically counterintuitive. So uh, you know, any large company when they want to start implementing DevOps, you know, they bring a, a you know a process in place, but the process does not actually represent who does what and where, right? So that's what we want to solve in the DevSecOps center. So that, this is where we said, you know, we will bring in security as an aspect into the operations model as well. So that one, you can uh, uh, make sure that your developers and uh, operations are uh, collaborating, but also making sure that, you know, as we grow, uh, uh, you know, as we as years have moved forward, security has become a key thing because everything right now is completely digital. So, uh, and security does not start in production. Actually, security starts at the developer's workstation. So uh, with the problems with the traditional infinite loop, people have started this additional layer of adding security into everything, you know, into the into the operations. And it just became too difficult for uh, for companies to sort of get these three layers to be working together, the developer layer, the operations layer, and the security layer. So we started asking some of our customers to help us figure out uh, you know, what their pain, or pain points are because we believe that we have the depth uh, and breadth of understanding. When I say we, it's just not our rabbit, the ISV system uh, that Salesforce uh, caters to, right? So there's a lot of brain power here and we basically are trying to make uh, the life of an everyday developer easy. So some of the challenges that we ran into are the software supply chain risk. For example, if somebody changes a profile uh, at a IDE and nobody catches that, like, you know, you just change from modify all uh, from false to true and you just push it. Uh, and if nobody catches it, that might lead into a very, very big problem you know, an embarrassing situation that a company cannot come out of. There are no dedicated cybersecurity teams for Salesforce. As far as you have seen, we've only seen that Salesforce security, when people think about Salesforce, they think that it basically 
uh, Salesforce takes care of security. It does not. You know, you know by, by the shared responsibility model, you are still responsible for your own data or the configurations that you put on top of Salesforce. Salesforce does, uh, 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 does promise the security at the data level. For example, the data that you put in is not going to be uh, stolen by hacking into a data center or something like that. But the data that you put in, you are responsible for it finally. Right? And the complexity of, uh, of Salesforce. Uh, now, everybody who is in and around Salesforce know how complex the object structure is in Salesforce. You know, the master detail relationships, the lookup relationships, the, you know, the different key values, the key pair values that you need to have. Uh, and ask any good data loading, uh, you know, a person who does data loading every day in and day out in terms of how that complexity can be really, really massive. And uh, like I was saying, the responsibility of the security uh, in terms of controlling this uh, software supply chain risk is with the customer. And But most of them, like I said, do not have dedicated teams in place in order to uh, sort of make sure that security does not come as an afterthought. And finally, like we have been saying, you know, we've been seeing this uh, trend since the early 2000s. And the Salesforce has been putting out a lot of tools uh, into the market and no tools does solve all the problems. And this is where, again, the ISV ecosystem is trying to work with Salesforce in order to bridge those gaps and make sure that you have uh, sort of a uh, stream aligned process of how you are be delivering clean, safe code. So the real question is how much should a CISO budget for a Salesforce cybersecurity risk? This is a very big question. I mean, uh, just just to take you on, on a uh, eight or nine month journey over the last nine months, you have we have seen like many many uh, uh, software vulnerabilities uh, come up, like the Log4j, the Spring4 shell, the Heroku attack, uh, the Solar Winds, and uh, we do not know the extent uh, you know the intensity or the extensiveness of these attacks. Uh, just for example, Solar Winds, uh, you know. Uh, uh, from what I read, solar the the solar wind hack they waited for twelve months in order to sort of really exploit it. So you really do not know where your next attack is coming from. So as the head of cybersecurity for a very large bank, but for example, how much should you budget, right? So these are the questions that you should really be asking to make sure that you are able to uh, sort of meet uh, your day to day business uh, business needs. And we believe uh, that this actually starts at the developer level. There is no way that you can control all of this in production. So, and you guys have probably seen this multiple times in terms of how technical debt sort of compounds you know, uh, as, as you go. So you, you might have heard in about shift left where people talk about making sure that you bring in security right at the developer level using the right tools in terms of these static code analysis tools or any kind of uh, composition analysis tools to make sure that you're capturing all your dependencies. And then there is the shift right approach where the shift right is more focused on operations where, where people are like, you know, doing stress testing, performance testing, making sure, you know, uh, the code that you're putting into your Salesforce does not, you know, does not behave uh, and does not create, you know, uh, a bad experience for your business users, right? So there's shift, in, the shift left and shift right uh, and then there is, you know, and what we think it really is, it's basically shifting in to security, not shifting left or shifting right, but it's shifting in, right? Uh, so, yeah, so essentially what, 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 what we're saying is you need to have continuous feedback from the QA to the developer, from the integration to the developer, from the operations to the developer to make sure that you're shifting in to security and not shifting left or shifting right. So, uh, so and just to give some color in terms of uh, how the Salesforce platform actually uh, thinks about it. So Salesforce is a key driver of digital, digital uh, transformation supply chain, and it is definitely at risk, like uh, the things that we have seen over the last 12 months. You have sensitive data everywhere. Uh, Salesforce is one of the largest repository of PIA data in the world. Uh, Salesforce metadata does offer a lot of uh, tooling in order to make sure that there is security enforced. Uh, and uh, what the responsibility of the developer is to make sure that uh, you're, they're not putting in poor quality code that can slow down feature delivery, that can hit security of a large bank, uh, bring in additional compliance and uh, risk, right? So uh, the essential tools in this era, basically people are talking about data backup and recovery, static code analysis, test automation, to make sure that you're able to shift in into, into security rather than shift left or shift right. 
And if you look at this on a uh, on a maturity scale, you would see that um, you know uh, on the standard process, people were just uh, in the early 2000s, we were only trying to use a Jenkins or we were trying to use a Circle CI in order to just get some automation in place. And then uh, we started mo moving into a DevSecOps model where we had like static code analysis bringing up to, to be brought in into the day-to-day -day operations of developers' life. But we still feel that in order to, and we, we have discovered uh, and we believe that uh, we have seen areas where there, need, there is a big need for improvement in terms of uh, uh, making sure that there's continuous learning that happens uh, as you move to the next stage uh, of DevSecOps, right? So we've seen that these are the different challenges of DevSecOps. How do you deal with these challenges? And that's what we'll be talking about next. Prashant, okay. if you want to catch your breath, um, I just want to remind everybody that we will be having a Q&A at the end. Um, so please drop in your questions. Um, we'd love to receive them. And I'm sure Prashant would love to answer them. All right, Absolutely. on to the optimization and, and uh, how do we solve this? Thank you very much, Lucy. I got carried away there for a bit. So um, li like you're saying, uh, you know, the traditional DevOps uh, model, you know, we've been traditionally uh, believed to think that the, the infinity loop sort of captures the day-to-day -day operations. But we believe this illustration here is the best version of the DevSecOps. And I think this here would be the guide for companies in order to make uh, the right decisions in terms of the process of the tools uh, and how they would be sort of making sure that they're able to you know, cut down on software supply chain risk. So uh, this illustration here shows how you are basically maximizing flow and uh, amplifying feedback loops. So you have uh, a dev stage, an integration stage, a QA stage, and a production stage. So at each stage, you need to be thinking about what are the different aspects that come into picture. Let me give you an example. So you need to make sure that the code, uh, the, uh, the code that the developers are putting in is clean and safe. So you need to have the right tools in terms of tracking the common weakness enumerations or making sure that that you're able to understand what are some of the governance rules that you need to have. And then you need to make sure that you have a secure way of uh, performing change management and the transportation of code from, you know, from the developer system to the version control system and back to a, a sandbox, right? So you have multiple uh, elements there in play. For example, your version control systems, your sandboxes, uh, your developer uh, IDEs and so on and so forth. So you need to make sure that all of these are acting together so that you have improved, uh, improved flow and there's continuous feedback loop that gets generated in any kind of actions that each developer does. Uh, and you often hear people asking like, you know, if you ask any um, you know, IT lead, what do you want uh, in terms of making, you know, in terms of having better business uh, business operations, they would say, we want faster releases, right? But how do faster releases happen? That's that's a key question that uh, made us uh, start, uh, you know, start think critically about this. And, uh, we, you know, we are happy to announce that uh, we have brought many, many customers start, uh, you know, start thinking in this model where uh, if you want faster releases, the only way that will happen is if you have continuous learning and if you have a continuous feedback loop. Fast releases are not an output of, you know, you know, cutting down metadata or, uh, you know, having a faster uh, sort of uh, pipeline into uh, your production or your integration. It's about how you, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, two developers interact with each other. How do they interact with the QA team? How do they interact with the operations team? How do they, uh, how are they collab uh, uh, collaborating with each other? So we believe that our tools uh, have the necessary, uh, you know, this feedback mechanism to connect those dots, connect those peoples, connect those stages. And that's how you can bring faster releases. So uh, you're making sure that your code is secure. Uh, you're making sure that you're uh, able to transport code. And when I say code, code exploded in, in Salesforce, right? So you no longer just have the metadata code. You also have the data configuration where, where you have these, uh, you know, where you're creating multiple applications of Salesforce using Salesforce data layer as your metadata layer. So you sort of create this meta meta layer. So you're not only transferring the code, but you're also handling code plus data now, and it just becomes more and more complex. So we believe, we believe that those feedback loops are really critical in Salesforce to make sure that you're able to think 
critically and progressively on how you can make your releases smoother, faster, and comparable. Uh, and at the same time, at each stage, you also have to make sure that you're you know, uh, you're not only moving code, but you're also securing code so that if something happens, you have uh, the, the right mechanism to sort of pull you back uh, into uh, from disaster, right? So at each stage, you need security, you need uh, uh, security in terms of transportation of code and security in terms of backing of code. So this is how clean and safe code sort of progresses through the different layers of SDL. So this is how we see it. And this is how uh, I think uh, the next generation of tools will be defined. So, so with that, um, you know, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, you're able to see uh, what's the impact of this, uh, of this flow. So, uh, by thinking critically uh, in the model that we just saw, you're able to have reliable security and structure. You're able to have streamlined communications. Obviously your uh, threat uh, security because of having great security and uh, your production cost will come down and you're consistently having a good high quality releases. Uh, we also want to take a minute in order to show you how we are uh, sort of bringing all of this uh, together uh, across the different uh, stages. Like I said, uh, if you go back, if I go back into these uh, feedback loops uh, that you see here, if you zoom in into, into each of this feedback loop, you will see some sort of a linear value stream uh, inside of that loop. So you uh, so these are this is a representation of how all of our products are coming together to deliver on that promise of clean, safe code. So we have the ARM, which is the release management platform, which allows you to sort of work with your version control, work with your sandboxes. And then we have CodeScan, which uh, basically does your automatic code analysis, threat management, making sure that you have the right security in place. And then we have our Vault, which is a data backup and recovery solution, which makes sure that the code that you're putting in is always continuously backed up. So the feedback loop that uh, that we believe is going to critically uh, take DevSecOps to its next level, to its next stage of maturity, uh, we believe we have the right uh, tooling in order to make sure that the collaboration uh, is happening. So I don't want to delve deep into this. If you please, if you have any questions or if you want to talk more about how this all comes into place across uh, the different uh, products that we have, or uh, just in terms of a conversation, in terms of how the, the different uh, stages of DevSecOps are sort of working with each other, uh, I'd be more than happy to have that conversation anytime. But uh, I want to uh, talk about what are the steps forward here. So uh, for people who are thinking about bringing faster releases, the, the first and foremost advice that I would have is you have to start at the developer level. You have to automate and secure your software supply chain as much as possible. There are a lot of tools that, will, that uh, we have right now in terms of Salesforce DX or Salesforce DevOps Center and uh, the multiple other tools out there, but it would be your responsibility to focus on the developer or start at the developer level and make sure that you're automating it. You have to make sure that you're protect, uh, protecting your production as we move into the uh, into the future. As cybersecurity would be, uh, you know, would be critical, uh, right? And we'll be seeing more and more attack patterns. We'll be seeing new uh, ways to sort of exploit users' data. So you have to protect your production at any cost. And as uh, uh, you know, a leader in uh, in your in your business as a CIO or a VP or uh, you know, as the head of uh, of your business, it would be your responsibility to protect your production. So you have to focus on identity and access management and their dependencies. So each time a profile is getting changed, each time a new permission set group is getting created, you have to make sure that uh, you, you have the right checks and balances in place to make sure uh, your production is not affected. And this is something that we have seen a lot of interest on where uh, companies uh, are now starting to do a threat modeling exercise around Salesforce. This usually happens for traditional software, but we have seen more and more companies wanting to do threat modeling exercises with us in order to understand what kind of attack trees can be leading up uh, into production or can be leading up uh, in order to, uh, to, to prevent a sensitive data leak. So, uh, and, by doing so, you also have to make sure that you are instilling this uh, cyclic feedback loops with your developers so that you're always in the know of exactly what is the code that is moving and making sure that the code is clean and safe. So 
with that, uh, I think I've, uh, you know, sort of shared uh, what I think is happening around us and how what I think will be happening in the future uh, as we go into the DevSecOps. So uh, like I said, if you have any questions, please do feel free to reach out to me uh, to continue the conversation. This is more about how we need to be thinking as, as leaders of uh, software delivery, how we need to be thinking critically about uh, how uh, in, in securing the future of our businesses and securing uh, uh, how we deliver the best possible experiences to our end users. So with that, Lucy, uh, yeah. I'm op let's open it up for questions. Yeah, absolutely. And do you see a QR code on your screen um, that will take you directly to the Salesforce DevOps industry report? which I'm sure we'll discuss a lot of DevSecOps. Um, well, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, Prashant. And um, also thank you to the um, Auto Rabbit team for putting together such great visuals. Um, I think they really distill down what can be quite an overwhelming and complex topic for people. Um, so well done. Um, one that actually really stood out to me was the technical debt and relative cost fix as it goes up. It's just things that you don't really think about, um, you know, not often you think about day to day, you know, and I just love the not, don't shift left, not, don't shift right, shift in, you know, um, great, some great takeaways from that. Um, so just while we um, give a couple more minutes for people to think of questions and type them in, um, I wanted to actually ask you from your own experiences, have you ever seen DevSecOps save the day? Um, you know, avert disaster in any way? Oh, absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so we have had instances where, uh, you know, we've seen, um, uh, well, let me, uh, without taking names and good night. Yes, I know. It can all be anonymous. Too, too much detail. <laughs> let me just say that there was, there was an incident where, um, you know, uh, one of the developers, uh, accidentally tried to change uh, a non-system admin profile. Uh, so this is this is the this is a company where they had multiple system admin profiles based for different regions and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So a developer uh, without his know uh, know how and why and what he's doing, uh, he, he sort of changed a, a, a the modifier setting uh, for that particular company. So they, basically everybody in the customer portal started seeing. Uh, seeing data that is not relevant to them. So that's where they reached out to us. And, you know, we, you know, not just that we, uh, we had them, you know, rectify that mistake using our, our backup and recovery, but we also sort of uh, uh, put in the right practices, put in the right systems there to make sure that such a kind of thing doesn't happen. So today, any kind of, any time there somebody changes a profile or permission set, it gets critically reviewed through a quality gate process and making sure that before that change actually hits production, the previous change is backed in uh, so that you're not losing data or uh, you're not putting in more people at risk. So yeah. Yeah, great story. Definitely. I'm sure there's more. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen a lot in your time working in the industry. Yeah. Um, so actually, that's a good point about the gates. Um, it's very clear on the DevSecOps optimization diagram. You've got so many gates going through. Um, and I think that's a really important takeaway. Um, so do you use feature-based um, feature branching or trunk-based branching? Um, it's a two-part question. And if you do use trunk-based branching, how do you handle release management and feature flags? Oh, that's a great question. So um, both branching strategies have their own pros and cons. There's no sort of one strategy that is better than the other. But uh, over time, people have seen um, more and more problems come up. Feature-based branching is great to start with. Right, but as you evolve uh, to like twelve months or twenty-four months, you have these uh, whole uh, you know bunch of branches, twenty thousand, thirty thousand branches that you just don't use, right? So source control should be about bringing people together and not siloing people, right? That's that's so. Let to to flip the the question on its head. You want more collaboration on your developers, uh, between your developers, between your QA engineers, uh, between your operations. How does that happen? If you have more branches, you're just splitting people rather than bringing people in, right? So, uh, and trunk-based branching is difficult to start with, but great to sustain, right? The, the reason is because you have a single trunk, and this is where the old uh, subversion systems were also built on. 
So you're bringing the entire code into one base. So you need to have the right tools. Uh, for example, you need to be able to do cherry picking and bring up and be able to cut off branches as you want to create tags inside your source control. You need to have uh, uh, the right tools to merge those cherry pick commits, you know, pick up a single commit and move it forward, tag it somewhere, uh, tag it as release 1.1 or 1.2 and so on and so forth. So like I said, each, each one has their pros and cons, but that's not what should be. Uh, the tool should not drive your branching strategy, your process your goals should drive your branching strategy. And that's what I've seen in my experience. We have implemented trunk-based branching uh, for many, many customers. Like I said, it's difficult to start with because you need to bring people together and bringing people together is always the hard part. So, and that is the reason why, um, you know, trunk-based branching works so, so well once you get, get the game going. Nice, nice. Um, you didn't leave your name, but I hope that answered your question. Um, gave lots of color there to the considerations love it um another great question coming up for you how does alter rabbit and salesforce devops center overlap uh well that's a great question so salesforce devops center is uh basically chain sets on you know chain, let's say chain sets plus plus it's chain sets on adrenaline uh where you have the ability to connect to a version control system uh, and do some source tracking and move across uh, the different uh, sandboxes that you have. So Salesforce, so DevOps Center is still in the start of its nascent stages. Uh, it still uh, does not use all the, you know, like Salesforce DX has about 150 to 200 commands. Salesforce DevOps Center does not even overlap today with Salesforce DX. So we're still a little far in that game uh, in terms of bringing, uh, you know, Salesforce DevOps Center taking a little bit of more mature uh, product in order to start interacting with uh, the ISV systems that are outside. So it needs to first interact with its, with its own internal tools and then sort of start external uh, integrations. Yeah, I'm sure it's something that everyone's thinking about, you know, um, it's been talked about a lot, but thank you for clearing that up. And thanks, Eric, for your question. Um, so we've got another one here. How does code analysis work at the developer level? That's a great question. That's a great question. So. Salesforce metadata is complex, right? So you have right from your objects, your applications, your LWC. And let me talk a little bit about the future here. So the future of Salesforce, the future where Salesforce is headed, as I see it, is Salesforce is opening its, uh, its platform up. So they're inviting uh, people, you know, with Salesforce functions, uh, anybody who has a software application built on Python or Java, you can you can now uh, sort of host it uh, on site, uh, you know, inside the Salesforce platform. So it's moving more towards the sort of this hybrid cloud uh, approach. And uh, with that, what happens, the challenge is you're just bringing in more and more software tools, right? So uh, today, today we just work with Apex and Lightning Web Components. I bet you in about six months and seven months, you will be seeing Python developers, Node.js developers working on Salesforce. So what does that mean for us? So it means that you need to have a, a tool at the developer level that is able to go through all of these different changes that Salesforce is bringing in. So you're not just working with Apex rules anymore. You're not working with Node.js rules anymore. Uh, you're not working with Python-based rules anymore, right? Apart from all of this, apart from the standard programming language rules, you'd also need analysis in terms of the Salesforce metadata. You know, I would definitely like to have a rule where I say, without having a description on a newly created field or without having a help text, that field should not go to production. I know it's annoying, right? But that's 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 something that I want my developers to follow. So. Code analysis is not just about static analysis or composition analysis. It's more than that. It is about your process analysis. It's about metadata analysis. It's about dependency analysis. So that's what uh, uh, code scanning should be at a developer level. So you scan everything from your language, your metadata, your identity and access management settings, and you need a tool that can give you real-time feedback. And that's what we 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 believe that code scan is solving and uh, we have great feedback from people around the world uh, almost all, every developer that uh, has used code scan you know they've enjoyed this real-time feedback that they get as soon as they type something code scan comes up and says that hey you did this wrong uh, and this is how you can correct it it's just again like that feedback mechanism it's just not about saying that you're wrong it's about showing how you can correct that and not repeat that so that's the continuous learning and that's how you get fast releases Amazing. Yeah. Um, 
so it scans multiple levels deep and and like you said i think a, a few years ago or a couple of years ago we, they there was something about code scan on salesforceben.com and it was called how good is your code or something like that um so you know it's all about that feedback and like you mentioned um so someone else that's also thinking about technical debt um does the um, does auto rabbit and the suite of tools help um identify technical debt yes yes in fact we do uh, uh and the way that we do it is you'd be able to so technical debt is like it makes me it, it makes my screen crawl when people talk about technical debt because it just is becomes massive you there is no company in the world that can solve all of the technical debt uh, on day zero if you start solving technical debt you would not be producing any more features you would not be producing any business value because you'd be just fixing what needs to be fixed so we have seen companies with about ten thousand days of technical debt so there's no way you can sort of start handling all of that so uh and the reason why i want to challenge this so much is when you think of technical debt, you need to be thinking about how you can, how you need to prioritize your debt, right? So that for that, you need the right tools in order to tell you that, hey, this is your baseline of your technical debt. So from here on out, you would not be having new debt lined up. So you baseline, and then you start working with your developers to make sure that, you know, having that code analysis in place, having that metadata analysis in place, to making sure that you're not adding any more technical debt right? And then you prioritize by removing the false positives, right? So there's, there's so many codes out, co, uh, tools out there uh, that, you know, as, a, as and when you run your code through that uh, code analysis tool, it'll just spit out everything that is wrong with it. That's fine. I mean, you can't change that uh, on day zero, right? So you need to prioritize. So you need a tool that tells you what are your false positives. You need a tool that tells you what are the areas that you exactly need to work on, which is impacting your, um, you know, your future. So that's what technical debt should be about and not solving uh, that's about 100 years old. <laughs> Nip it in the bud and then go yeah. from there. <laughs> Great. Um, so we're coming up to the last question, everybody. So just to remind you uh, to grab your copy of the that industry report that's on the screen using the QR code. Um, so final question for you. How do you handle Salesforce dependency analysis during the deployment? Oh, wow, that's a great question. And we thankful to Salesforce for bringing uh, this great dependency and uh, dependency management object. Uh, the dependency tooling API object that allows us to scan dependencies. So uh, Salesforce, uh, we have to give it to the Salesforce product and they have been amazing in terms of bringing the right uh, tooling for, for a developer. So we use the tooling object to find out your where dependencies and what dependencies to figure out how that ties into your deployment, into the artifacts that you're trying to deploy. And we will flag that for you saying that these are the objects or these are the fields that you're missing, or this is the profile that you're missing. So it's like that feedback loop. So we use dependency analyzer, we use code analysis to make, your, make the developer uh, do his best, bring his craft uh, to, to its A game and making sure that uh, they're able to remove the anxiety and drudgery that comes with software development. They have wow. to trust the system. Wow, you've made Auto Rabbit sound like a one-stop shop. And uh, I'm glad, thank you everyone for um, those questions. And I think it enabled us to talk a bit more about, you know, how much you can actually do with Auto Rabbit and how much they're thinking about the future. Um, so thanks once again, Prashant, for um, giving us all this insight. I really enjoyed this session. Did you enjoy the session? <laughs> oh, I loved it. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, We'll, uh, there'll be details about the on-demand um, recording as well, so you can uh, look back at this. All right, take care. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.